It is often assumed that all species of life on Earth have a purpose, a role in the balance of nature, if you will. But there are few creatures on Earth as revolting or as dubious in value as botfly parasites. I have dealt with the dreaded tree squirrel botflies before in Florida, but not seen any for quite a few years now. So I was quite surprised to witness an infestation of botflies high in the Great Smoky Mountains early in the fall of 2022. I documented at least five different squirrels in the woods with varying numbers of botflies in late September and early October 2022, one of which in a very rare case succumbed to a single botfly. The tree squirrel botfly, or Cuterebrae masculator, is a parasite of tree squirrels and chipmunks throughout most of eastern North America. The adult and other stages are rarely seen. Instead, what is observed from July through September or October is the outcome of infestation. The relatively large fluid-draining swellings or warbles on a host squirrel caused by the larvae under its hide. The tree squirrel botfly has been reported from some 20 states in the U.S. and two Canadian provinces throughout eastern North America. Botfly infestation may be mistaken for another lump-causing affliction of tree squirrels, a viral disease called squirrel pox or fibromatosis, which is distinguishable from botfly infestation by a higher number of smaller lesions, especially around the eyes, swollen digits of the infested animal, and a lack of distinct fluid draining opening in each lesion. The tree squirrel botfly is one of some 300 species of Cudorebra native to the Americas, five of which are found in Florida. This species that afflicts squirrels was named Cudorebra emasculator some 150 years ago by one of the most prominent entomologists of that period, Asa Fitch, based on the false belief that the larvae consumed the testes of male hosts. Although that is not true, it is not uncommon for squirrels to have botfly larvae invade the testicles. I've seen that in both Florida and North Carolina. Tree squirrel botflies undergo complete metamorphosis which consists of egg, larvae, pupa, and adult stages. This species has one generation per year throughout its range. The pupal stage overwinters buried in soil and requires about 8 to 10 months before emerging as an adult. Tree squirrel botfly adults are black with a pale yellow thorax and smoky black wings. They are relatively large flies with broad bodies about three quarters of an inch long and generally resemble bumblebees but they don't visit flowers for nectar or pollen or consume other food or bite or sting. Tree squirrel botfly adults appear in early summer and seek a mate. Female Cudorebrae masculator presumably lay their eggs on natural features such as twigs, branches and vegetation in the habitat of their hosts rather than directly on their hosts as do some species of parasitic flies such as horse stomach botflies and blowflies. The female Cudorebra botflies can lay around a thousand eggs. Tree squirrel botfly eggs are off-white and about a sixteenth of an inch long and resemble tiny grains of rice. Larvae develop to the first instore but remain within the egg until body heat or carbon dioxide from a potential host stimulates them to rapidly emerge through a trap door at one end of the eggshell. The legless larvae of flies are called maggots, and the larvae of botflies are often referred to as bots. First instars of botflies comprise the infective stage. They're whitish and encircled by several bands of black spines. Upon emerging from an egg, a larvae may attach to its surface with a specialized pad-like structure and sway back and forth in a questing behavior. If a first instar contacts a potential host and is able to transport to it, the larva may enter an orifice, the mouth, nostrils, anus, or a wound and begin a journey through the host's body that lasts about a week. It then settles underneath the host's hide, molds to the second instar and creates a hole to the exterior. This warble pore provides access to air for breathing and a route for elimination of liquid excrement. The presence of the larvae stimulates a reaction by surrounding host tissues, which form a pocket or warble that encapsulates the larvae. 
After a week or so, the cream-colored second instar, which is encircled with bands of black spines, like the previous instar, molds to a third instar. This third and final instar has two prominent black mouth hooks and is covered with fish scale-like cuticular platelets. Initially these are cream colored and then they pass through the darkening shades of tan, eventually becoming dark brown as they age. This is a mature botfly I removed from a dying squirrel. It's dark, hard, and leathery, and was about ready to come out on its own, so it was easy to remove. Typically, only one larvae occurs in each warble. The botfly larvae orientates with its head end situated toward the inside of the host, and its atal end, which contains two kidney-shaped respiratory spiracles at the warble pore. Unlike many other arthropod parasites of vertebrates, Botfly larvae do not ingest blood, but instead consume lymph fluid and possibly cellular debris and leukocytes of the host. Here you can see the botfly removed from a dying squirrel and pierced by a barbecue skewer, showing the clear liquid that was inside. It's not blood, but clear to yellowish lymphatic fluid. Total larval development of the tree squirrel botfly lasts three to four weeks after which the mature larvae emerges from the host by backing out through the warble pore, dropping to the ground and burrowing into the soil where it pupates. The pupal stage consists of a dark chocolate brown hardened puparium enclosing the pupa that develops into the adult fly after passing through the autumn, winter, and spring in the soil in a state of suspended development. Commonly reported natural hosts for acute Ereba emasculator include eastern gray squirrels, fox squirrels, and eastern chipmunks. American red squirrels and flying squirrels are rarely reported as hosts, and I've never seen an afflicted red squirrel, flying squirrel, or chipmunk in my experience. Fortunately, mother gray squirrel remained botfly free and quite healthy looking while raising her late summer brood, and she did not transfer any botfly eggs or larvae to her kittens. I also noted all healthy red squirrels and chipmunks. I would imagine botflies would obviously be much harder on chipmunks due to their small size. The larvae of botflies also occasionally infest unusual hosts such as raccoons, cats, dogs, and humans, an affliction term cuterebrosis. But exactly which species of cuterebra are responsible in these cases has seldom been determined. Currently there is no hard evidence that cuterebra emasculator affects humans although it's not impossible. Botflies are obligate parasites requiring a living mammalian host for survival. So if they kill their host before they're fully developed, they will also die. So there should be a strong selective pressure to minimize their negative impacts on hosts. A variety of physiological effects on a host may result from infestation by larvae, including anemia and changes in the size of certain organs and glands. These effects generally do not cause the death of individual hosts, and they seem to have little negative impact on the overall host population. Gray squirrels are often infested by one or several larvae. The large fluid-draining warbles are often associated by patches of bare skin due to scratching, and appear rather gross. An otherwise healthy adult host with access to adequate water and food probably can tolerate at least four or five of these insects with little obvious effect on its behavior, other than stimulating efforts to scratch the warbles. But at higher infestation levels, squirrels with 10 or more larvae have been observed, and in situations where there is a scarcity of food or water, or if the host is an infant, pregnant, or nursing infants, these parasites can be harmful. As an example, a heavily infested squirrel may become weakened and more vulnerable to predation. A fatal bacteria infection may set in, or a mother squirrel may experience a diminished milk supply leading to the death of her nursing offspring. With gray squirrels, the larvae are often found in the upper torso, although they may occur on the head, limbs, and most other areas of the body except the tail. In an unusual case that I documented in a separate video linked in the description, a single botfly larvae caused the death of a gray squirrel by being positioned inside the throat and along the esophagus, likely interfering with vital life functions. All of the other squirrels with botflies appeared to remain active and recover with no lasting ill effects as they had access to quality water and food supplies for the duration of their infestation. 
Because tree squirrel botflies are natural native parasites of squirrels and chipmunks, control efforts are not initiated. There is no known method for preventing infestation by these larvae. However, if an injured or orphaned animal that is also infested with larvae require care from a wildlife rehabilitator or veterinarian, the larvae is often removed. Forceps are used to grab the posterior end of a larvae through the warble pore and is gently pulled out. The empty warble may be flushed with an antiseptic followed by application of antibiotics. Sufficient studies have not been performed with antiparasitic drugs to recommend their use in controlling botfly infestations. Empty warbles typically heal within a week or so after the larvae has exited naturally or has been removed. As with other Cuterebra species, Cuterebra emasculator has little or no direct impact on humans. Many people observe tree squirrels such as when these animals visit bird feeders or are purposely provided with food. In such situations, concerns are often raised over the presence of squirrels with large tumors. Frequently asked questions by members of the public include, what is wrong with these squirrels? Can this problem spread to my family or my pets? And what can be done to help the affected squirrels and protect other squirrels from this problem? And in fact, there are no known treatments available to prevent infestations of the natural hosts. Concerns regarding infested squirrels spreading this affliction to other squirrels, other animals, or humans are unfounded. Once a larvae becomes encapsulated under the hide of a host, it remains at that site until fully developed. Only the first tiny instar is infective. Possibly a dog, cat, or other pet that has been outdoors might have infective stage larvae crawling on its fur that could transfer to and infest a person coming in contact with the animal. Such infestations have not been definitively documented, but they are remote possibilities. However, as previously mentioned, there's no evidence that the larvae of Cuterebra emasculator have been responsible for any cases of cuterebrosis in domestic animals or humans. This squirrel is well on its way to completely healing from several botfly warbles as the fur begins to grow back on its midsection. Plentiful fresh water like this mountain stream and a quality food supply are essential to survival. Except in rare cases like the one I documented, the squirrels usually make a complete recovery from the botfly infestation.